everyday allergies like asthma and eczema and hay fever were one of the most common things that I saw day to day in my clinic. And with the right approach, they can be managed very, very effectively. Now, can our diet get rid of allergies and take them away? Absolutely not. But the right approach can minimize symptoms. There is, however, one particular supplement that was always the top of my list whenever I was working with any patients that were presenting with these kind of issues that is possibly one of the most effective at completely pushing down symptoms and making these everyday allergies completely manageable. That supplement was reishi mushroom. This potent medicinal mushroom is probably well known to you, but if you don't know what it is, it's like a, a, a very tough, dense, woody mushroom that grows on trees and at the foot of trees on, on, on the root system. It's most common in Asia and the US, but I have even found it here in the UK on Hampstead Heath in London. This mushroom has got a track record for supporting the immune system that spans centuries and an evidence-based, and we're talking double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials level evidence base that spans decades. And what I've found in clinical practice is this is one of the most effective interventions for these everyday allergies. Now, before we actually kind of look at how reishi does what it does and how it actually supports allergies, I want to take a wider look at how the medicinal mushrooms work and how they do what they do. Medicinal mushrooms have become incredibly popular over the last few years. And I think it's important that we actually understand what they do and how they do it. So there is one thing, one active constituent that all of the medicinal mushrooms have in common. And that is a group of very, very large, complex, high molecular weight sugars known as polysaccharides. Now, these are very, very complex sugars. They're not broken down or cleaved by things like pancreatic enzymes. They're not broken down in the small intestine like more simple sugars would be. They also don't really have any impact upon the gut microbiome. Obviously, you may know that there are some complex sugars that we find in high fiber foods that don't get broken down in the small intestine, but will actually get fermented down by means of saccharolytic fermentation within the colon by the microbiome. The polysaccharides in mushrooms don't do that either. The weird thing is, these mushroom, these mushroom polysaccharides, these sugars will actually come out the other end intact, if you know what I'm saying. They will actually make it all the way through without getting broken down or absorbed, yet they can still have a profound and pronounced effect upon our immune system. How do they do it? Well, within the wall of our gut, we have little patches of tissue called Peyer's patches. These are part of our lymphatic system. And these Peyer's patches, I like to use the analogy of being like a surveillance station or a security guard's hut. There's a cell, certain population of different white cells, things like antigen presenting cells, and then there's other cells called dendritic cells that are constantly monitoring gut contents. Because if you think about it, via the mouth, the digestive tract is a very, very easy route for opportunistic pathogens to enter our body. If that system is not very, very tightly policed by the immune system, then all kinds of chaos could unfold. So it makes sense that we have ways to actually monitor what's going on in the gut. And it's these little patches of tissue, the Peyer's patches. The cells that dwell within those patches of tissue are constantly monitoring gut contents and then relaying that information back to the rest of the immune system by means of a group of communication proteins called cytokines. You may well be familiar with these. What happens is when the mushroom polysaccharides come into contact with the Peyer's patches, the cells that are within the Peyer's patches start to smell a rat. They, those polysaccharides actually set off like an alarm response. They raise the alarm. The cells that dwell in the Peyer's patches will actually send an alarm to the rest of the immune system. We're not entirely sure why, but one of the theories is that these polysaccharides are similar in structure to extracellular polysaccharides that are found on the outside of certain types of bacteria, for example. Whatever it is, these polysaccharides trigger an alarm response within that cell population of the Peyer's patches. That cell population then sends a cytokine signal to the rest of the immune system and causes a 
basically uh, uh, an upregulation of certain cell lines within the immune system, particularly macrophages. That whole response increases the number of macrophages, but also enhances macrophage motility. So the actual speed and efficiency to which macrophages will migrate to the source of infection, for example. And we also get an upregulation of a group of cells called natural killer cells. So this is all well documented. Like I say, there, there's nearly 40 years of double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials. Just look at the work of Dr. Hiraoki Namba from the Kobe Pharmaceutical University, for example, if you want to go deep into that rabbit hole to see how those polysaccharides actually work and the clinical outcomes that are associated with that. So look, that's the wider picture. That's the general way in which medicinal mushrooms support our immune system. But reishi has another little trick up its sleeve, which is especially useful for any allergy sufferers. There's compounds in reishi, still yet to be identified, but it's possibly some of the resinous compounds, that will actually interact with a group of white cells, a group of lymphocytes called T helper cells. And what T helper cells do essentially is sort of regulate and orchestrate different types of response from the immune system. They regulate different types of immunological response. In essence, within our immune system, there's two distinct ways in which it operates. There's a million among different responses and nuances, but we can look at it as being as, as responding in two distinct ways. There's one branch of our immune system, which is what we call antibody mediated, which is obviously we are exposed to a certain pathogen or some kind of antigen. And then once we've experienced it once, we develop antibodies to it. And then our immune system knows how to respond to it when we're exposed to it in the, in, in the future. That's like, you know, very often with some of these key viruses like measles or whatever, you experience them once and that's probably the only time you'll ever get that infection because the immune system knows what to do. So that's one branch. Then you've got another branch, which is called nonspecific. This branch of the immune system can't necessarily, it can't identify a specific antigen, but it can determine whether something is self or non-self, like whether something belongs in the body. It can also detect cell surface markers within infected tissue and identify damaged cells. So it's equally as powerful, it just works in a different way. Now these two branches of the immune system, these are mutually inhibitory, which means when one is active, the other one is suppressed. It's like a physiological seesaw, okay? When one is active, the other one is suppressed. What Reishi does, is it instigates something, I mean, the, the all of the physiology be, behind this is hellishly complex, probably beyond the, 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 the scope of this video, but it causes something called Th1, Th2 shift, okay? So the T, T helper cells will go into different subsets. One subset instigates antibody-mediated responses, and the other subset will instigate non-specific responses. What Reishi does is it stimulates the T helper subset that pushes the body more into the non-specific type immune response. Think about this. What is it that's driving these everyday allergies? It's antibodies to a specific thing. In hay fever, it's antibodies to certain pollens. In asthma, it's antibodies to dust mites. In eczema, it could be a million and one different environmental factors that we've actually uh, developed antibodies for. By the way, those three things are exactly the same condition. Asthma, eczema, hay fever, they are exactly the same condition. They are a type two hypersensitivity reaction. They're, they're called the atopic triad. They're the same condition that manifests in different tissues. Anyway, they're driven by antibody mediated immune responses. If we were able to push up the opposing branch of the immune system, what happens to those antibody mediated responses? They don't go away. The condition's not been cured, it's not been gotten rid of, but we're pushing the body into a state where the thing that is driving the symptoms is pushed down, and it's pushed down without weakening our, immun our immunity in general. So what Reishi does is it pushes us into an immunological state that down-regulates antibody-mediated responses and up-regulates non-specific, and in doing so, gets rid of the symptoms. This is transient, as I say, it's not getting rid of the issue. It's not getting rid of the problem. It's just a very effective, natural way to manage it. It can help people to be symptom-free and it can do it very, very rapidly. I've had people come into my clinic that have had 
been suffering hay fever for absolutely years. Nothing's really made much of a difference. Within four or five days on reishi, bam, they can like go out in summer. So this is an incredibly, incredibly effective intervention. What's the best way to take reishi? What's the best way to incorporate it into your day-to-day -day, uh, regime? It must be taken as a supplement. Now, you can buy dried reishi and brew it as a tea. But if I make that recommendation to you, you will never, ever forgive me. It is intensely bitter. It's disgusting. It's vile. It's horrible. It's very, very, very bitter. What you need to look out for is a good quality capsule that contains both fruiting body, which is actually the mushroom that grows up above the ground, and mycelium. Mycelium is like a mushroom's root complex that's under the ground. Those two together has the entirety of the chemistry associated with those mushrooms. As I say, the compounds responsible for that Th1, Th2 shift are yet to be accurately identified. The theory is that it's part of the uh, the, the resin compounds in there. But when you, when you have fruit body and mycelium, you will have the entirety of that mushroom's chemistry and you know you'll be getting the right compounds in there. With hay fever, for example, you start taking it literally as soon as hay fever season starts. If it's things like asthma and eczema, you can take it ongoing. It's incredibly safe to take long term without any kinds of issues. So look, I hope you found that interesting. If you like this, please do share the video. Please also subscribe. Give it a like as well. It's super helpful for me here. And I will see you next time, my friends. Stay healthy.